So why don't you just start off by giving us an idea of kind of what you do and what your area of expertise is and how that relates to Zizzo and gamification. Hi, everybody. So my name is Patrick Callahan, and I uh, am a lecturer with Tallinn University, a guest lecturer with Tallinn University at the moment. I specialize in teaching uh, game design for learning game design and also gamification courses for the university. I've spent the last 15 years of my life or so uh, teaching languages at universities around the world and working on how to get people to engage with a system that they're not familiar with uh, through gamification uh, and learn the languages that way. Mostly I was working in countries where English was not a major language. So creating methods to get people to engage with the language even though they weren't as comfortable with it was the major way that I came into gamification. In addition to that, I also consult on, on storytelling and narrative gamification design for specific projects. And I also have spent quite a bit of time consulting on uh, game design specifically for cybersecurity issues and for how to make sure that uh, your training purposes are meeting your learning objectives in a game design scenario. Yeah, that's a lot of things to unpack. So I'd love to go a little more in depth on a couple of things you touched on, um, especially because you and I have talked about them mm -hmm. outside of this, and I'd love to kind of get into that. So first, let's start off with um, the language learning. Can you go a little more in depth on how you use gamification with the language education? I think that's really interesting. Well, one of the primary elements of gamification is creating fast feedback systems. And one of the primary, one of the problems that language teaching has is this divorce in time from action to feedback. So the person takes the action and then they are not getting the feedback in a timely manner to be able to move forward and to work with the production. So a lot of what I was doing in language teaching was designing quick, easy to explain games so that I could then be circulating through the classroom and engaging the students who needed the feedback by listening in and monitoring. So in many regards, what I was doing was I was creating metrics to look for. And I created a continuous assessment methodology that reflected gamification principles. I actually created the continuous assessment before I understood what gamification was. And it's only after I started doing all the reading that I went on to realize that the principles were gamified. It was a gamified system. Uh, I have since presented on the system that I have built and explained how it actually followed the process of gamification before I understood that the term even existed. So with language, and especially with any learning that you are trying to get a person to do, one of the big problems is this idea that you have to stop the learning to assess what is happening. And if you are stopping the learning to assess what is happening, you are impacting the amount of time that the player or the student has to actually engage with the learning. So if you are losing 50% of your time or days of your time to assess, you're not getting as much time, you're not giving the person as many opportunities to actually show and to actually improve. So gamification, when it's done correctly, and it has to be done correctly, it, and it is an art form as well as a science, lets us do forms of stealth assessment where we're seeing what the person is learning and engaging with throughout the progress, throughout the system, rather than the more traditional learning model of you have your midterm exam and you have your final exam. Well, the midterm exam only gives us a snapshot and the final exam only gives us a snapshot. And we don't want 
snapshots because they can give us false information. They can tell us, well, we can't differentiate if the person is doing bad in the subject or if the person's dog just died, for example. Um, we're putting too much emphasis in modern educational formats on these summative assessments and these huge high stakes scenarios rather than assessing clearly by looking at what it is that the person is doing continuously. And this is where gamification really comes into its own, especially in terms of uh, accurate assessment, in terms of player motivation, because they're actually feeling like they have agency in the system, and uh, also with their uh, ability to enjoy and understand the feedback loop system through it. So yeah, that's part of what I was doing with the area of education. After doing this for several years and writing curricula and uh, writing uh, textbooks for various uh, projects, I decided I wanted to go back and study how games actually reflect the learning process. And that's why I went uh, to the University of Tallinn to begin my, my postgraduate studies there. So we're going to get into this a little bit further in, but I, I just thought of it now and I kind of want to touch on it a little early. What would be your prediction or like your dream setup for a classroom setting where gamification could kind of solve that problem of what we're lacking with traditional exams? Like how, if you could change the education system to give us a more accurate feedback loop using gamification. Walk me through how you would set that up and then give me an idea of how realistic that would be. Like, do you think we're headed in that direction or is it still a pipe dream for us right now? Well, we've already had experiments in that direction. So we've had uh, places like Quest to Learn out of uh, New York City and a couple of others. Uh, the thing is, I can't give you a clear example of what I would imagine it being because that would take a little bit too long to explain. Longer than our 20 minutes. Uh, yeah, um, th th this would be something that I would spend three to five days explaining the, the methodology before uh, about. The problems that we have in the modern education system are manifold. But some of them are the reliance on declarative knowledge. So we rely on telling somebody something and then asking them to repeat it. If we look at the educational literature, this has been pointed out as far back as 1936 by Alfred North Whitehead, I believe, that this is the idea of inert knowledge that is possibly harmful to the person because they can't do anything with it. We have an over-reliance on snapshot testing and we have an over-reliance on metric testing that doesn't necessarily relate to what it is that we're learning or what it is that we're doing. The classic example of that third one would be the over-reliance on psychometric and IQ testing, which the validity of it is questionable for many areas, but it's still being relied on because it is the test that is most commonly recognized. The idea, especially out of the United States, of the no child left behind policies, where standardized testing was being, and the idea of rigorous testing is possibly, or is antithetical to the idea of cognitive mentorship and the ideas of the more knowledgeable other helping you to progress your skills and move forward. And um, a much better speaker on this uh, entire area is to take a look at Sir Ken Robinson's talk uh, from TED Talk on the future of education. He goes into a lot better depth and a lot more eloquently than I ever could. That was um, awesome. Uh, I will definitely check out that TED Talk too. Uh, I love watching gamification TED Talks. Well, uh, th this is much more about the nature of education. Awesome, awesome. So um, we're, we'll circle back um, into that whole like prediction of the future in a little bit. But I also want to touch on what you do with cybersecurity in relation to gamification because mm -hmm. I find it 
super fascinating um, and it's it's already interacting with our workforce. So if you could just go a little more in depth sure. on that, uh, I would love to kind of share that with everyone. The issue is that um, cybersecurity gaming uh, has a couple of areas in it that are kind of unique. One is it has a huge, it has a very thick fog of war element to it. The attacker will, it, and it's asymmetrical, the attacker will know the position of the defender, but the defender is not going to know the position of the attacker and may not even know that they are being attacked. So the traditional models of uh, the war game models are not as effective as teaching tools in this regard, because ye, the war game models are predicated on this idea that you know who your attacker is, the attacker is rational, and the attacker is ruthless. The problem is, if we don't know who the attacker is, we cannot ascribe rationality, and we don't know whether or not they're going to be ruthless or what we mean by ruthless. So the, the, the so that entire concept of the known game space and the, the two people looking at their version of the known game space breaks down quite dramatically. In addition, you have to take things like the insider attack model into into consideration and how do you model an insider attack inside of a game environment so that the player can accurately engage with it in a lot of the gaming that is done for specific training purposes we end up with uh, unfortunately a case study that the player is taken through and they're asked to make decisions at certain points along the case study. The problem is that very few people have actually studied how to make those decisions important because the decisions that they are being asked to make are often inconsequential and have no bearing on what the final game state will turn out to be. And if this is the case, it is a thin veneer. It is game washing, not in fact game design. It is slapping a, a paint job over the top and hoping that nobody notices. So in terms of cybersecurity, you've got a whole pile of, you've got considerations that you have to be aware of before you start designing the game, before you start engaging with the client about what it is the game is supposed to teach, how it is supposed to teach it, and what are the learning outcomes that they are looking for. There, there, there are two sort of schools in this. There are the stress test schools, and there are the, the creation of knowledge schools. Let's call them that. Uh, I'm simplifying quite a bit. Um, with the stress test tools, they are normally trying to put the player under stress and try to see what decisions they will make in a timely manner as quickly as possible. The knowledge creation area, which is not as well served, they're more about trying to create connections between knowledge paths that players already have and create a language that can bridge between management and the technical skills or uh, the engineers and the uh, media people or this group and this group to create an area where they can discuss and uh, develop the ideas out. So yeah, it's a, a fascinating area. I've recently been doing a bit of research on narrative uh, design and how that impacts the, the methodology uh using uh pseudo plotting structures to pathway out the learning path and understand which which ones are viable for which type of learning that you're attempting to engage in but yeah i, I could talk about that for 
another Forever. couple of hours. Yeah. So I, I want to kind of switch gears here um, and get kind of your take on the changes that you're noticing as time goes on. But before we do, I, I'm just super curious. Do you have a favorite gaming mechanic? I know in our past conversations, we've talked about like our pet peeve of just slapping points and leaderboards on things. But there are certain mechanics that I love to see in gamification. Is there anything that like you feel like it should always be involved or that you feel like it's it's a really just most fun mechanic that you like to involve in things? You see, this is the, the problem with being a, uh, with being a uh, student of these things, uh, is that I look at the mechanics and I see the value and downside to each and every one of them. So, for example, uh, I think it was, uh, there was a beautiful example of a gamification design, which was a fish stuck to a bus window. I can't remember the name of it at the moment. I think it was in Dresden. And if you closed one eye and tilted your head, you could get the you could get the fish to come up and down like this while you were on the bus. And the object was to get the fish to eat as many passerby's heads as possible. <laughs> now, in a traditional gamification metric, it does not contain points does not contain badges, it does not contain a leaderboard, it does not contain, all it is based around is this creation of this fun little, uh, this fun little narrative, narrativology, narratology. But it still was engaging and it still was interesting for the people who were engaging with it. Does this have advantages? Yes. Does it have disadvantages? Yes. So I, I love the use of points, but I feel that a lot of people don't understand what pointing system to use, which of the, I think it's six that uh, Zickerman uh, recognizes, which of the systems to use in which case. Uh, I love micro accreditation is a fascinating field and warms my heart towards the uh, future of education. But again, they can be demotivating as well as motivating. Understanding that leaderboards have the, have, can have a, a demotivating effect and understanding how to create social leaderboards versus, uh, versus sheer rankings and understanding that the player typologies will be attracted to different different player types will be attracted to different mechanics and different display mechanics all becomes part of the design process so is there any particular thing that i i love above all else no because each one has a different purpose it's it's a bit like asking a uh, in my case it's a bit like asking a chef which is, what type of knife is his favorite um, and the answer is whichever one I need to do the job. I like it. I like that a lot. Um, so when we're talking about all of these different gamification mechanics and all of the ways that you've studied them, but also had the chance to implement them, mm -hmm. uh, I'd love to hear kind of what changes you've seen over the year, both on an individual le level, maybe in your students and the different generations that you've taught, but also on a more global level, what trends are you seeing? What are you seeing be prioritized more for businesses when they come to you for solutions? Are you seeing a shift? or have things kind of stayed the same over the past, say, 5, 10, 20 years? Um, again, you know you're okay. asking me a really difficult question. Um, we can break it down however you want. If you want to start just with the students, we can do that. Well, let's start with the students. Uh, I tend to find that students, if, once they understand a system, specifically they understand a system that is attached to their grading and they understand that they have agency and can take control of it their motivation goes through the roof uh, my classrooms were i was the bane of my fellow english teachers uh, uh, in universities because people in my classroom were talking loudly <laughs> they were engaging with the language in a conversation class and literally they would be uh i at one stage was 
seriously considering getting earplugs for myself because it was a very small classroom and I was getting a headache by the end of the day. So I also can say that uh, one or two of my students recognized how much of a game the system was and gamed it and came out with scores of 106% in participation because they understood exactly how to, what to do. And the system was designed to encourage people to game the system because the more they were gaming the system, the more they were engaging with it. In terms of solutions for businesses, a lot of businesses out there understand the buzzword of gamification, but don't understand the necessity and the design that goes into it. Uh, I teach a specialist course for small to medium enterprises sponsored by the Estonian government and in gamification and getting people to understand what it is that they're attempting to do and how to do it is incredibly important. Um, the other sort of field I see is the attempt at gamifying people rather than gamifying a system uh, and using gamification as a control methodology. I think the most prominent one in the news today is the Amazon case where they are attempting to gamify their system. And this is doomed to failure in my opinion because they are attempting to psychologically and philosophically different things at the exact same time. Um, gamification, if I was to explain it as simply as I can, is the addition of complexity. It is adding complexity to a simple task to make it more engaging. Now, we can go into the Dettering definition, which is the addition of game-like elements to non-game situations, but a game is a more complex way of doing something than the easiest way of doing something, is a simple way of putting it. The problem is that Amazon and the majority of businesses out there are based on the Taylorist model, the Henry Ford model of production where everything is simplified and simplified and simplified so it can be done quickly and efficiently. The problem with doing something that is quickly and efficiently is it is boring. It is not engaging. It is not going to make the person think or cause them to uh, question, how can I do this better? They're just going to do the task that they need to do. The line is just going to move forward. And this is a problem when we are dealing with the knowledge work that is necessary in the 21st century. We need people to be actively engaging with material. We need people to be synthesizing material. We need people even who are doing relatively simple tasks to understand the task at a level that they can recognize how to move it forward and change it. And we can't do that by breaking it down and de-skilling it. We have to allow them to exhibit skill and exhibit how to do that. And we have to encourage the formation of skill. And the better way to do that is to engage them with game mechanics and to put those challenges into the place so that the person is confronted and engaged. Um, to borrow from zoos, uh, in zoos, they have enrichment activities for the animals in their care. Gamification creates human enrichment activities. They create activities that the person wishes and wants to engage with so that they can better understand the task and have a more active and enjoyable lifestyle. And with the, with, the, with the movement towards that knowledge-based economy, we need people who are more active and engaged. So these are the, the, the things I'm seeing. 
as a trend. We, we need to move a little away from the Henry Ford model and the Taylorist model and to go back towards the old school skilled worker model where we actually build and support our workers to increase their ability because as we increase their ability good things start to happen we start to see increased uh increased uh, employee loyalty we start to see increased employee uh, capability and we start to see increased uh, employee productivity which of course we then have to cycle back into our reward structure to help to make sure that the that employee recognizes that as an employer we care about them their lives their families and their well-being mentally as well as just what they're producing that was a really good answer i love that zoo analogy too i'm like i'm definitely gonna have to borrow that i really like the way that you put yeah. that um and this segues perfectly into like my big question which everyone always hates me when i ask this because it's very broad so break this up and approach it however you see best fit but just give me your take on the future of work so i know that you kind of touched on where it should go but what are your predictions i mean i think we've probably had one of the most impactful years in a long time as far as changing the course of the future um so i'd love to hear kind of what have you seen and what do you think we're going to see in the next few years um, with the way the workforce is going to change and, and how will gamification play into that, do you think? Well, the first thing to say is that the gamer generation is coming of age. So uh, the current or the average age of uh, game players is approximately 37 to 39. I, I, keep, I can't remember when I read the statistics, so I'll, I'd have to go and check. But this means that the people who have grown up playing games are now coming into the workforce. These people are less inclined to put up with the traditional chalk and talk model of creating something. They are less, they are less motivated by purely financial means as uh, they are also motivated by impact and importance. So uh, Prinsky, yeah, Mark Prinsky, uh, in his book, Digital Learning Game Design, uh, talks about this concept of the gamer generation, which would be the millennials through to Generation Z, who are much more likely to want to get their hands dirty, roll up their sleeves and play with the system a little bit to figure out how it works rather than having to ask someone. So you're going to see a shift in how knowledge is applied in the workplace. Now, how is this going to change work? It's both going to change work fundamentally and not at all, because there are still going to be uh, manual jobs and production jobs, which require the same industrial educational standards where you first you do this, the procedural knowledge. Those are going to still be in place, but those jobs are going to be decreasing and decreasing and decreasing as they're outsourced, as they're roboticized, as they are done away with. What is going to replace them are the jobs that require creativity, require interpersonal rela uh, relations, require discussion, require thought, and the able to synthesize, synthesize knowledge and create. So that's where the growth is going to be into the future. Uh, it's going to be away from the purely physical to the more intellectual style of work. And we can't apply the industrial model of teaching to a post-industrial society and expect good results to happen. It's, it's just, it's, it's taking 
it's taking and giving value to the wrong things and expecting people to do the wrong things that we no longer need. Now, the future of work. I'm not so much sure about the future of work. I'm much more interested in the future of training and the future of learning, because of course that's my work and my field. Um, and in that, I can see much more emphasis being placed on practicality, much more emphasis being placed on understanding how to do things, how to engage with something how to reach out and uh, find more information from other sources. Uh, I'm just getting my, working my way through Andy Clark's book on, uh, what is it, Natural Born Cyborgs, and the argument that humans are starting to use thinking tools outside of our brains for storage and for recall purposes and that this is a natural way that humans are. We are such good tool users that we put part of our intelligence into the tool. So the thing is that our tools are getting more and more complex. So we're going to be meeting people who are more and more comfortable with using the tools designing the tools and fixing the tools into the future. Wow, that was another great answer. This has been awesome. You've made my job extra easy today. Um, so like I mentioned before, I want to give you a chance before we uh, end the interview to kind of brag a little bit or even just share how people can connect with you. I know as we're talking, I'm thinking of like four people I'd love to introduce you to so they could talk to you. So why don't you share best way people can get in touch with you and then anything else that you'd love for people to check out that you're working on? Sure. Um... You can uh, get in touch with me uh, with my name, P-E-A-D-A-R at T-L-U dot e, e That's my university address. Uh, you can get in touch with me via that email address. You can also tweet at Pather Callahan. Uh, and I do have a website that I desperately need to find some time to update. Uh, but uh, if you, uh, I'm sure you'll put my full name on it, on the, uh, on the thing. I have the advantage and disadvantage of being one of only two Pather Callahans on the planet. That is pretty lucky. So a web search for me will reveal pretty much, uh, will find me. Let's put right. it that way. Um, things that I'm working on at the moment, I have just... Uh, I'm, I've just finished a consultation with a company uh, who we are designing a better uh, cyber war game, uh, cyber t training games uh, called Cyberfish. Uh, and I am currently looking for new opportunities to consult on game design for learning purposes. Uh, I've spent I finished writing two articles about uh, cyber wargaming and the principles behind cyber wargaming, one for Strife blog and the other for the Information Security uh, Network blog. Uh, and I am currently working on a article uh, with uh, a well-known wargame designer. I'm not going to mention names here, uh, a well-known war game designer and another learning expert on the nature of games themselves, the, the underpinnings and philosophies of defining what games are, and uh, hopefully they'll be publishing that soon. And finally, I have been invited to a couple of conferences, which I will be posting up on my website eventually to uh, let people know about my speaking opportunities and speaking engagement. 